Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. My name is Elizabeth Waite. I'm a program coordinator with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. Today I'm honored to have Professor Park Williams present research on the impact of anthropogenic warming on an emerging North American mega drought. Dr. Williams is the Lamont Associate Research Professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. He's a multidisciplinary hydroclimatologist whose research aims to understand causes and consequences of hydrological extremes such as drought. Much of his research focuses on climatology, and his research also aims to improve understanding of how hydrological extremes affect life on Earth. Questions that he finds especially interesting involve the effects of human-caused climate change on the hydrological cycle and how those changes affect ecological systems and humanity through extreme events such as heat waves, wildfires, and flooding. His ultimate goal is to advance scientific knowledge in ways that are relevant to policymakers and future scientific endeavors, and also interesting to the public and other scientists. Today, Dr. Williams will share with us his recent research on how global warming is pushing what would have been moderate drought in southwestern North America into mega drought territory. In this webinar, I'll share a brief overview of NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDAS, and then Dr. Williams will present his research. After his presentation, we'll open the webinar for your questions. Throughout the webinar, all participants are muted, so if you have a question for Dr. Williams, please write your question in the question box in the GoToMeeting control panel. Then at the close of the webinar, a survey will pop up, and we ask you to please take a moment to answer the four brief questions so you can provide us with your feedback on this and future webinars. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be available on drought.gov. And you can see the website address at the bottom of your screen there and uh, other slides that I'm showing. So NIDAS was created by congressional law in 2006 with a mandate to help the nation prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought by establishing a national drought early warning system. And NIDAS achieves that goal through the development of regional drought early warning system, uh, drought early warning systems. Those are shown in the map on this slide. And in those drought, regional drought early warning systems, networks of partners and stakeholders support communities to prepare for drought. NIDAS also supports research to improve drought predictions, forecasting and monitoring, as well as effective drought planning and preparedness. And all of our work is done in collaboration with a wide range of partners at all levels. I encourage all of those attendee, all of you attendees in this webinar to explore the US Drought Portal at drought.gov, where NIDAS hosts a wealth of drought resources, including data, information, tools, and research. In addition to the regional drought early warning systems, NIDAS works on several national scale initiatives, including drought and public health, drought and wildfire, drought impact reporting and analysis, drought indicators and triggers, and the National Coordinated Soil Moisture Monitoring Network. In addition, NIDAS offers webinars of relevance to the entire country. Two upcoming webinars that may be of interest to you are shown on the screen here. On the 27th of May, John Fleck, the director of the University of New Mexico's Water Resources Program, will present on coping with mega drought in the Colorado River Basin. And this webinar will address how water managers, communities, and others are adapting to long-term drought conditions with a focus on the most vulnerable in the basin. And then on June 3, uh, we'll host a webinar on drought decision-making tools you can use. This webinar will introduce you to two tools available across the continental U.S. for drought monitoring, presented by Catherine Hegevish. She's a research scientist at the University of Idaho, and Rebecca Ward, assistant state climatologist for North Carolina. Also, we'll have Jeff Marty, the drought coordinator for Washington State, join us, and he will share how he uses the Northwest Climate Toolbox for drought monitoring in the state of Washington. Information on these webinars will be available soon, and we'll let you know when um, you can register. And if you're interested in learning more about NIDAS, please go to drought.gov or feel free to contact me. And now I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Williams. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. We look forward to hearing about your research. Okay, thank you very much. 
I will assume that my screen is visible now and that everybody can hear me and then I'll be told otherwise if I'm wrong. It's all um, good. Great. I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, uh, my co-authors on this study. The, the work definitely could not have been done uh, without them, as well as the funding agency. Uh, this was funded by a paleo climate uh, and climate change, the P2C2 program through the National Science Foundation. And the motivation of the study is really the knowledge that uh, that water is uh, really the governor of the distribution of life across the West. Anybody who's driven across the West on a road trip knows this, and it's exemplified in these in these two figures on the opening slide. And also the knowledge that when the globe's climate changes, then the distribution of water across the continents change. And there is paleo evidence. Uh, showing this is certainly the case in North America where uh, previous warming events are coinciding with drying. And in recent decades, in recent decades, we've seen a, a transition toward drier conditions. Uh, humans have felt this uh, as they have uh, watched the average storage of uh, in reservoirs decrease as a result of increased evaporation and decreased uh, stream water flow. Uh, uh, these drought conditions have incentivized rapid extraction of groundwater in some places at an unsustainable rate, such as parts of California's Central Valley. Ecosystems have shown uh, that they are feeling the effects of drought. Uh, we have seen a, a remarkable increase in the area uh, burned by wildfires in a given year over the last 40 years or so, especially in forested areas. And we've seen giant bark beetle outbreaks uh, in several different episodes throughout the uh, Western region, some of which have been larger than uh, is believed to have occurred in, cent in centuries. And these drought conditions really began, the drought conditions that we are familiar with today is the 2000s uh, drought really began in the year 2000. On the left, I'm showing observed precipitation in uh, a region called southwestern North America, and I'll show a map uh, in a bit uh, showing exactly what I'm, the region I'm talking about here. And you can see there's been no long-term trend in precipitation, but beginning in 2000, there's been an abnormally high frequency of uh, quite dry years with a few breaks in between, um, but really a fairly persistent uh, drought from a pers precipitation perspective. From temperature, you see something quite different. You see, of course, this uh, centennial warming trend and in the last 20 years, there's only been one year that we would consider to be in the range of normal compared uh, relative to the, or what we would have defined as normal in the 1900s. And this warming could be contributing to enhanced drought by enhancing uh, evaporative, or could be enhancing the precipitation driven drought by enhancing evaporative demand. And this is, of course, consistent with what global climate models say should be happening in the West. The globe has been warming due to greenhouse gases accumulating in the atmosphere, and the West is not immune to that. Um, and so there's reason to believe that perhaps the drought that we're seeing, the drought conditions we've seen over the last uh, two decades or so have been amplified or increased because of uh, human-caused global warming. But any discussion about how human-caused global warming is affecting drought in the West needs to be couched within the greater knowledge that giant so-called mega droughts are signatures of natural climate variability in the West, meaning that just because we are experiencing bad drought conditions in the West doesn't automatically mean that this is due to climate change. Nature has uh, proven itself capable of uh, causing phenomenally dry conditions for decades or even centuries at a time in the West. These droughts are referred to as mega droughts. That we only know about them from the tree ring records, or that's how we first learned about them. And to this day, they're spoken about with almost a mythical-like quality. Uh, they're quite different from anything that uh, modern society developed during during the 1800s and 1900s. The mega droughts were more severe and longer lasting than anything we saw through the 1900s. And so, from a water management perspective, they've always been viewed as a as a kind of a worst case scenario. And it's been worried that as we warm the world, we might be loading the dice more toward uh, mega drought type conditions 
but mega, but it's also to be remembered that mega drought type conditions could emerge on their own even without the assistance of human caused climate change. And so that sets up what I'd like to talk about in uh, uh, the rest of today. I'll be addressing these three questions. One, uh, the last 19 years, or specifically 2000 to 2018, seems dry. How dry were they really compared to other drought events that occurred during the observed period that began in the 1900s? Um, how have these 19 years of uh, on average drought compared to these infamous medieval mega droughts that occurred throughout the medieval period begin in the 1600s or sorry 1500s and finally was there a role for climate change in enhancing the current drought and if so how much uh, just some housekeeping before we move further we'll uh, talk a, a little bit about uh, methods First of all, a drought can be defined in a number of ways. Today, I will be referring to drought specifically to mean abnormally low soil moisture plus whatever uh, snow might be sitting on the ground. And this is specific to summertime, summertime soil moisture. The time scale I'll be focusing on will often be a 19 year time scale. And what I mean by that is I'll be showing a lot of 19 year running mean time series. And the reason for doing that is specifically because 2000 through 2018 was quite dry. That's a 19 year period. 2019 was wet. And now here we are in 2020. And 2020 is once again fairly dry. But we know that 2000 to 2018 was pretty persistently dry. And I'm interested in knowing how that 19 year period compared to other 19 year periods over the last 1200 years. Uh, to assess drought over the past century, we'll be using soil moisture that's calculated from, from a range of land surface modeling approaches uh, based on observed climate data. To assess drought prior to the last century, prior to the observed period, we'll be using tree ring records. And then in trying to attribute or decide how much of observed drought was due to climate change, we're using a combination of climate observations and earth system model simulations. Uh, in our uh, land service modeling, we take two different approaches. On the left is illustrated a complex hydrological model, such as the VIC uh, hydrological model. This, is a, uh, this type of model can be run at a high spatial resolution. It requires daily or sub-daily data, uh, but it can carefully keep track of soil moisture, uh, reserves, snowpack, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, keep track of energy balances in a fairly realistic way. The drawback is that these models are very comp computationally expensive. We don't really trust daily and sub-daily data uh, all the way back to the beginning of the century in much of the West. And, um, and these two things combined make it pretty difficult to run sensitivity analyses where we run the model over and over and over again to try and parse out the effects of different variables. On the simpler end of the spectrum is what we call a bucket model, where we pretend that the Earth's surface is covered in buckets, and it runs at a, at a monthly time step, where if we know how much precipitation fell out of the sky in a given month, and if we know what that temperature or what that month's temperature and humidity and wind and solar radiation were, then we can keep track of how much water is in each bucket from month to month, and changes in the in the level of water in the bucket can be related to changes in moisture supply and therefore drought severity. Uh, of course, a bucket type modeling approach is only useful if it gives you uh, something that you trust. And here I'm trying to show evidence of this, where we have tuned a bucket model to have the temporal persistence of a complex hydrological model, in this case, NCAR's NOAA land service model. And here, when we force both models, our bucket model and the complex hydrological model, the same climate forcing data, what I'm showing is that we get essentially the same records of soil moisture. The red colors on the map indicate that we're modeling soil moisture records that look very similar to the more complex hydrological model soil moisture records across most of the continent. And here in yellow is our study region, which we refer to as Southwest North America. If we average summer soil moisture throughout this region for each year and then compare the time series of regionally average summer soil moisture simulated by our bucket model versus the complex hydrological model, we get essentially the same record. In fact, the agreement between these two records is just as strong as the agreement between two different complex hydrological models, such as, say, 
the NOAA model and the VIC hydrological model. Of course, no modeling approach is useful if it's not reflecting reality. And luckily in the West, we have a whole bunch of drought sensitive tree ring records where in this case, trees can be treated as uh, in situ uh, soil moisture sensors. Each, each dot in the map, each red dot in the map represents a location where we have drought sensitive tree rings, a, a, sorry, a drought sensitive tree ring record. And if we just average the tree ring records across all of these dots and compare it to the average summer soil moisture record in this region, the middle plot here is showing that our bucket model actually accounts for interannual variability in tree rings quite well in this region, as does the VIC model shown on the right, but not quite as well. And so this indicates that perhaps the bucket model is even representing summer soil moisture variability in the region more accurately than the VIC model. Importantly, the VIC model is not uh, designed uh, with um, soil moisture modeling specifically in mind. It was designed more for runoff modeling. Um, but here I show that our soil moisture record uh, modeled by the bucket model actually captures variability in runoff very well as well. In black, we're looking at a time series of uh, uh, soil moisture simulated by our bucket model in the upper Colorado River Basin. And in blue is the observed record of river flow at Lee's Ferry, which is an independent record. And so these analyses are to hopefully convince you that our bucket modeling approach actually is capturing reality pretty well. But throughout the talk, I'll be showing both, I'll be showing the re, uh, results from both modeling approaches, our bucket model approach, which we can again run many times for sensitivity testing, as well as results from the DIC modeling approach. And so now we can assess the first question, which is how does the previous, this recent 19 year drought period, 2000 to 2018 compare to uh, other 19-year uh, drought periods just during the observed period beginning in 1901. And that's what I'm showing here, first with our bucket model. The map is showing how the, this recent 19-year drought period ranks among all other 19-year periods beginning in 1901, where the darkest brown colors show record-breaking 19-year drought, meaning 2000 through, 2000 through 2018 was the driest on average 19-year period uh, since at least 1901. You see a lot of brown, but not record-breaking conditions everywhere. If we average across our Southwest North American study region, however, then we see in the last 19 years was by far the driest on average. And so the uh, time series here, the black, the black line is showing annual summer soil moisture simulated by the bucket model. And the red is a 19 year running mean. And so the last point here on the red line is representing the final 19 year period, which is 2000 to 2018. And we see that that period was by far the driest, uh, uh, the driest 19 year period during the observed record. And now showing the same results, but from the VIC model, we see some similarities and some differences. Uh, we can see that overall the uh, map indicates a lot of drought in the last 19 years. The spatial distribution is a bit different. When we average across the whole region though, we see that once again, the, the final 19 year period, 2000 through 2018, was significantly uh, drier than any other 19 year period during the record. And so our answer is that based on both of our summer, of our soil moisture modeling approaches, 2000 through 2018 indeed ranks as the driest 19 year period in the observed record. But how does this 19 year period compare to the infamous mega droughts of the medieval period and, and uh, the 1500s? And we address this question using tree ring records. This picture was taken by Daniel Griffin of a cross section of Douglas fir tree and it's showing annual tree rings where a wide ring indicates a year with good growth. And in this case, that means a lot of moisture available and skinny ring re represents a year of bad growth, or uh, and in this case, uh, not much moisture available. And the cluster of skinny rings in the late 1500s is actually allowing us to visually identify what is known to be the most recent of these infamous mega droughts. The Western uh, part of North America is a great place to be using tree ring records to understand past drought events because 
there are a lot of drought sensitive tree ring records. Uh, tree ring scientists have been collecting uh, tree ring records throughout the region for almost a century. And it is, the, it is because of the generosity of hundreds of tree ring scientists in the region that we have access today to so many long drought sensitive records. Uh, here I'm showing the locations of almost 1600 tree ring records, many of which go back to 1000 AD or, or, even, or even further. We'll be using these tree ring records to reconstruct our summer soil moisture records modeled using our bucket modeling approach as well as the BIC hydrological modeling approach. And the methods we're using to reconstruct uh, soil moisture are the same methods that have been in development over the last couple decades by Ed Cook and his colleagues, the methods that have been used to, um, to produce uh, previous versions of the North American drought atlas and drought atlases on other continents. This map is showing that our tree ring reconstructions do very well. We used these tree ring records to reconstruct summer soil moisture at a half degree spatial resolution across the continent. And the colors here are showing the cross validated R squareds, where we compare our reconstructed estimates of summer soil moisture during the observational period to our observationally based calculations of summer soil moisture based in this case on the bucket modeling, uh, uh, on the bucket model. And you can see that throughout our study region, we are uh, capturing uh, the vast majority of observed variability um, at up to 80% or more uh, throughout a lot of the Southwestern um, North American study region. And so now if we average our reconstruction throughout our study region, which is bounded by the yellow box and create a time series of summer soil moisture, then we can see that for this regionally average reconstruction, we're getting really exceptional accuracy now with the cross validated R squared of 0.85. And so what we're looking at here is the uh, uh, a blue time series, which is our so-called observed record of summer soil moisture. These are summer soil moistures uh, that are uh, simulated by our bucket model based on observed climate. And the red time series are out of sample reconstruction estimates. And what I mean by out of sample is for each decade shown in this time series, we left that decade of data out, produced the reconstruction algorithm using the remaining 90, uh, 90 years in the, in the record, and then used that, algorithm, used that reconstruction algorithm to make reconstruction estimates for the decade that was left out. We then stitched those out of sample decade long estimates together and uh, calculate correlation between these out of sample reconstruction estimates and observations. And you can see that going back to 1700 AD, when we have access to a whole bunch of tree ring records, we do really well with the cross, cross validated R squared of 0.85. When we, if we want to go back further in time to, in this case, 800 AD, we can see in the map that we have a much lower availability of tree ring records. There aren't nearly as many long tree ring records as there are short tree ring records. But even using this subsample of tree ring records that go all the way back to 800 AD and redoing our reconstruction approach, we're still capturing 70% of the observed variability and that's shown in the time series. And in the map, now we can see why we've chosen the Southwest North American study region. Whereas we did very well at uh, capturing observed drought variability with our reconstruction going back using all the available treating records. There are not that many treating records uh, from eight, going back to 800 AD in Mexico or north of the um, southern border of Montana. And so now here is our reconstruction of summer soil moisture going back to 800 AD averaged across the Southwest North American study region. This red time series of reconstruction values has, uh, ha, is a 19 year running mean of, of reconstructed values. And the blue is our observed record, which is driven by observed climate data, but simulated by our bucket model. And what you can see is, first of all, you can see the presence of these big mega droughts, the most recent of which was the, really see why these got their name, there's nothing in the 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s, it really looked like one of these mega droughts. And then 
at the end of the record, the final value here is representing the 2000 through 2018 average drought severity, your average soil moisture anomaly. And we carry that across on this horizontal blue line so we can directly compare that final 19 year average drought severity to all other 19 year drought severities. And what we can see is there's only one mega drought, the 1500s mega drought that had any 19 year periods when drought was more severe than that which was observed. Importantly, this drought severity falls within the reconstruction, reconstruction uncertainty of all of the mega droughts. And so we cannot confidently say that there's only been one mega drought that had a, that had a drier 19 year period, but we can confidently say that this drought looks a lot like the mega droughts and not so much like any drought that we've seen in the preceding 400 years. Um, and that's been a ca the case all along the way. Here I'm showing the trajectory of the 2000 to 2018 drought in red. And what I mean by that is I'm showing the annual accumulation of drought anomalies starting in year one of the drought, that's in year 2000, coming up through 2019. I do the same with all of the rest of the mega droughts, which are the other colored lines. And you can see that our, that, that the status of 2000 to 2018 as being on pace with the mega droughts isn't due to just one or two really bad years. It's been on pace with the mega droughts all along the way. Whereas other somewhat serious extended droughts are shown in gray lines here. And you can see that as of, uh, as of year 19, these are really quite uh, weaker um, multi-year, multi-decade droughts than the, uh, than the current drought or the other mega droughts. Uh, importantly, the conclusion uh, is not a whole lot different when we redo the study uh, where we uh, reconstruct the VIC hydrological model soil moistures rather than the bucket model. Uh, in this case, the VIC reconstruction actually indicates that the, that the last 19 year period, 2000 to 2018, was the driest 19 year period of uh, the of the whole uh, 1200 year uh, reconstruction. Um, but you can see here that the that the uncertainty range on this reconstruction is really a lot wider, meaning that our ability to reconstruct the VIC soil moistures was, was actually much reduced compared to our ability to reconstruct the bucket model, meaning the tree ring records agree better with the bucket model soil moisture than VIC, which is why we chose to present the bucket model results as the primary results in this study and the VIC model results as the supplemental results in the study. And so the, to answer our second question, we do find that 2000 to 2018 was right on track uh, following a very similar trajectory to the medieval mega droughts with one key difference. And that is that the medieval mega droughts were all longer than this 19 year drought that they're being compared to. Uh, the 1500s drought lasted about 28 years and the 1200s, uh, that, that mega drought lasted for nearly a century. And so it still remains to be seen whether the two, whether the 21st century drought becomes or is remembered as a classic mega drought or whether it ends uh, early, uh, shy of that. All we know right now is that the first 19 years of this drought look pretty much indistinguishable from the first 19 years of the infamous mega droughts. And so finally, the third question, how much has change contributed the 2000 through 2000 drought, if at all. And to take and to address this question, we use a climate change attribution approach. And uh, this specific approach is pretty simple. And I illustrate it here before we go more complex in the next couple of slides. Illustrate it for just temperature. The black shows the observed temperature of North America from 90 through 28. The what climate model in this region can cause emissions as well in C, uh, and this is the this isn't just a trend simulated by one climate model; it is the average trend simulated by 31 different climate models, and so there's a whole lot. Of data behind the showing is a single, which we treat our best guess, best estimate of climate change affected in 
temperature over the last century. If we then subtract the model trend, which is the human caused climate change part of temperature, if we subtract the model trend in temperature from observed temperature, then we get this teal time series. And what the teal time series is representing is the temperature of a hypothetical world where year to year and decade to decade fluctuations in temperature occurred. Yes? Dr. Williams, apologize for interrupting. Um, the, your audio going in and out. Of, some folks had trouble on the slide. I was wondering if you could and explain the slide. It will be better. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm um, having a, I'm problems with, and so I'll try. But uh, I'm cutting out. I, I apologize. There's I, there's probably not, not much to do. Um, but can you be okay at the moment? It's it's still a little bit um, cutting in and out a little bit. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say there's, uh, on my yeah, end... there's not much you can do. I wonder, um, Adam, can he call in um, by phone for the audio portion? Is that possible? Yeah, no, I think he might be back. It might be back better. Try it, try it again, Park. Might be back. You could just, yeah, back up on you the slide what? a little bit. I apologize for interrupting. Okay, no, it's just these are the uh, unavoidable issues that yeah. we are all facing right, right, right now. Thank I'm you for persevering. In, it sounds better now. I'm living in a retirement community at the moment and uh, the internet demands that the normal occupant of this house are much lower than my own. Um, now it sounds good. Now it sounds good. Okay. Sorry about that. So, so I will uh, summarize what I was just saying by saying basically the teal line in this record is representing a hypothetical world where temperature still varied naturally but without the background trend in warming caused by human emissions of greenhouse gases. Now of course this is a gross simplification of the global warming process as uh, greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere a lot more changes than just the background state of climate for example variability of climate changes the magnitude of extremes change and in this study, we're ignoring those effects. And the goal is to simply isolate the effect of the background trends in what we would refer to as normal mean climate. And what we can see is taking this approach uh, that Southwestern North America during our uh, period of interest, 2000 to 2018, was on average 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than it would have been without human caused climate change. And overall, as of 2018, uh, temperatures uh, due to human-caused climate change, as defined by the CNOP-5 models, had warmed by, one point, by about 1.5 degrees Celsius, or about uh, 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we can now take this approach uh, a bit further into the water balance, applying it to both the supply side and the demand side of the water balance. On, on the left, we're looking at, in black, observed precipitation in our study region, and then orange is showing that the, that the climate models average out to show not much human-caused uh, trend in precipitation. And that might be why we, in fact, have not seen much of a trend in the real world's precipitation. Whereas on the right, now we're looking at vapor pressure deficit, which is a combination of the effects of both temperature and humidity. And this is really the variable the temperature is working through uh, when it enhances the aridity of the atmosphere uh, to, to enhance evaporation. And what we can see is that, uh, is that uh, climate models indicate that it really is the human-caused warming that accounts for the vast majority of the uh, increased aridity uh, or the heightened aridity that we've seen in uh, previous decades. And if, it, and if we could redo the last century without the, uh, without the warming trends, then we would see the last 20 years we're still a little bit warm because precipitation is low and, and uh, the air tends to be warm and arid when precip is low. But 
that the air would not have been nearly as warm and arid as it was in the observed world were it not for human-caused climate change. We can then apply this same approach to uh, simulate our bucket model, and I'm showing you the results of that now, where the blue, or sorry, the black is the record of 19-year average soil moistures um, uh, when our bucket model is forced with observed climate data, and then the teal is the same thing, but when our bucket model is forced by the uh, hypothetical climate records where the CMIP-5 model trends have been removed. And what you can see is that even in the absence of climate change, uh, the teal indicates that 2000 through 2018 still would have been uh, abnormally dry. And that makes sense. The tropical Pacific has been uh, in a state uh, that is known to promote uh, drought across a lot of Western North America for the majority of the last 20 years. But that that drought wouldn't have come close in severity to the drought that's actually been observed. And by our calculation, the multi-model mean trends in temperature and precipitation and humidity combine to account for 47% of the observed drought's magnitude. What that means is that the observed drought has been almost twice as large as we would, ex as we would have expected in the absence of human-caused climate change. And that, those conclusions combine to give us the result that, yes, without climate change, we still would have had a naturally occurring drought, but that it really is the extra heat from climate change that has been responsible for putting this otherwise garden variety drought onto, the, onto a mega drought-like trajectory. What does that mean going forward? Well, in this study, we explicitly did not project uh, drought trends going forward, but the orange line here is showing what the human-caused climate change contribution has been to the background mean state so far. And what it's indicating is that uh, this, dry, this, this trend in background mean state trend uh, drying is still probably in its infancy. Uh, for example, it would not be surprising at all if in the, last, if the next 50 years see three more degrees Celsius warming, whereas the past 120 years only saw 1.5. Importantly, the tree ring records remind us that climate can change all on its own, sorry, that, that climate varies very strongly all on its own naturally, and that that will not stop. And so this drought that we're in now will very likely end at some point, possibly in the next decade, before this drought really meets what we'd call a full-on mega drought standard in, type, in terms of length. But as time goes on, this background drying trend will continue to grow, and it will continue to take more and more good luck to stay out of droughts and less and less bad luck to fall back into droughts. Finally, all the results I just showed are, uh, are fairly simplistic, and they are treating the multi-model mean as our impression of what climate change actually is. And that's probably not quite accurate. Now I'm showing results from the range of CMIP-5 models, where the gray lines are showing the precipitation trends simulated by each of the 31 different models. And you can see there's a range of impressions out there for how climate change should affect precipitation in the West, with some models suggesting substantial wetting and some models suggesting substantial drying. And in this map, the lack of black uh, hatching throughout the map indicates that in any given region or any given spot within the West, uh, the models really tend to be all over the place uh, with not much consensus on whether it should get wetter or drier from, from a precipitation perspective. And this really carries through to cause a lot of uncertainty uh, in what the actual contribution from human-caused climate change has been. When we took the multi-model mean uh, climate trends, those accounted for 47%, but I would not hang my hat on that being the actual um, true effect of climate change on, uh, on the observed drought. Each of these gray lines is showing what we'd get if we'd only used one of the 31 different models. And yes, 75% of the models do indicate that the, that the, uh, 81% of the models indicate some amount of drying effect due to climate change thus far, 
and 75% of the models indicate that that drying effect accounts for at least 35% of the observed vari variability. But you can see that uncertainty in precipitation in the, the effect of human-caused climate change on Western North American precipitation really hinders our confidence in, um, in detecting uh, exactly how much of a given drought is due to human-caused climate change. Another uncertainty comes from uh, uncertainty in really what the best, best method is for hydrological modeling. Here now I'm showing you what we, what we get from the VIC hydrological model when we run it with and without human-caused climate change. And red means human-caused climate change causes this drying in VIC soils. And you can see that's really only happening in wetter places, mostly in the mountains, but in deserts, Vic basically says these places are so dry already, an extra degree or two of warming can't dry out summer soils even more or anymore. And in fact, some of these soils actually get wetter in a warmer world because the rare snow event uh, turns into a, ra a rain event and uh, causes deep infiltration right away. Um, and so there may be much more geographic diversity in the human in the drying effect of human caused climate change than uh, was suggested by our um, by our bucket model. Uh, finally, uh, there are a lot of uncertainty in future water supply it comes from uncertainty in how plants will respond to changes in climate and atmospheric chemistry and nutrients. Uh, some new methods are being developed to try and account for the fact that the CO2 goes up, plant water demand might go down as plants are able to uh, survive with their stomata closes closed for longer, thereby leaving more so uh, water left in the soil. When we employ those methods to our bucket modeling approach and redo the whole study, we find some changes in our results, but, no cha but not changes to the ultimate takeaways. And those are shown uh, in this figure, indicating that the last 19 years still would have been in the ballpark of the mega droughts, even, or still is in the ballpark of, this, of the mega droughts without, or when I uh, make these, um, uh, changes to the methods and without the human caused trends in temperature and precipitation and humidity, uh, the drought would have still been uh, substantially weaker. In this case, employing, employing these methods takes the ultimate result that human caused climate change accounts for 47% of the drought severity down to 30%. Very importantly, our ability to model vegetation is still really limited. And this method here, I don't think is uh, is necessarily the, the better method here, as I think that we still have a long way to go before we understand how to, how to properly account for the effect of CO2 on vegetation. And I finally end with this last slide, which is showing uh, no longer the results of offline hydrological modeling, where we take observed data and see how climate change has affected soil moisture in the observed world, these are, these are fully coupled model simulations from the CMIP-5 experiments. And what they are showing is that models, even these coupled models that are trying to account for CO2 fertilization effects and land atmosphere interaction effects and other complexities that we have a tough time dealing with in the offline models, they also agree that the, that, uh, the Western U.S. summer soils, sorry, what the Western North American summer soils should, as of 2000 to 2018, be drier on average than they would be without greenhouse warming. And so the answer to the final question is, our estimate is that yes, uh, human-caused climate change did contribute importantly to this drought. We estimate 47% based on the uh, multi-model mean trends in climate, but we think that there's a lot of uncertainty around that number, and we're much more comfortable saying the human-caused climate change has contributed substantially to the drought, but, the, but it could be anywhere probably from 25% to over 47%. And with that, I'll leave you with a list of what I think main takeaways are, uh, and I will uh, stop talking there. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. That was a fascinating presentation. We have several questions uh, popping up for you here, and I'll just read them out as they have come in, the order they came in. The first one is, 
is rain intensity taken into consideration, such as what falls in runoff, running off more than soaking into the ground when compared to previous droughts? Great question. The, um, uh, the short answer is, is yes, but I think maybe no for what you're, for what you're asking. Let, let me explain that. We are, uh, we run our soil moisture uh, simulations using observed climate data. And so uh, in the observed world, uh, we, we know, especially in our VIC, our VIC model experiments, we're using um, daily precipitation data, we know th those model simulations are taking into account the, um, the difference between a very high intensity precipitation event versus a sprinkle. Uh, however, when we're trying to assess what the effect of climate change has been on soil moisture, we are not taking that into account. What we're doing is simply removing what the climate models say is the change in the background mean in precipitation totals. And so we're not necessarily, if the model, we, we know that the models also say that uh, precipitate, that the distribution of precipitation events should be changing with extreme precipitation events getting more extreme and uh, and in some places the uh, percent of days where there's no precipitation increasing. That was not taken account, into account in this study and is something that we explicitly ignored even though we are confident that it also has an effect on soil moisture. Okay, thank you. Another question here. Um, uh, I understand the choice of 19 years is based on the 2000 to 2018 period, but what happens to the statistics if you were running the mean over 20 years instead of 19 years? The, uh, yeah, the 19 year period was, was specifically chosen because we were interested in, in that uh, time frame. If we did 20 years rather than 19, then that would mean including 1999. Uh, rather than, uh, so we'd be looking at 1999 through 2018, and essentially we'd see no change. We'd see that the, well, these are the changes we'd see. We'd see that the observed drought was slightly less intense, and because of that, the proportion of the observed drought that the background drying effect due to climate change accounts for would be greater. And so if we were to say expand that to 25 years or 30 years, then we'd be in training wet years of the 1990s into this analysis and we'd find that observed drought over the last 25 or 30 years was even weaker and that because warming was still occurring in the background loading the dice toward drying then the background warming would account for even more of a percentage of the observed 25 or 30 year drought anomaly than the 19 year drought anomaly conversely if we had just been interested in uh, say 2018, a single drought year that was pretty intense, then we'd find that human-caused climate change did not contribute that much to that individual year because that individual year was extreme due to natural climate variability. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, you're averaging data across a large study area. Aren't portions of the study area differentially influenced by Pacific Ocean weather systems and Gulf of Mexico weather systems? If so, how does that affect the record and your analysis in subregions within the study area? Yes, the, uh, there are a lot of regional nuances. And uh, because of time, I had to uh, present the entire Southwestern North American study region almost as if it was one grid cell, but it isn't. And it actually wasn't treated like that in the, in the study itself. Um, First of all, we find that the severity of uh, of average drought conditions in the last uh, in the last 19 years or 2000 to 2018 uh, varied geographically. With the most severe drought conditions um, occurring in Arizona and Southern California, and less severe drought region or uh, drought conditions in uh, the northern areas, Northern California, for example, locally uh, that 19-year drought period ranked um, somewhere between 6th and 10th um, uh, in the 1,200-year study period and not, uh, and not second, the way we did when we looked at the full, um, the full regional mean. In terms of climate influences, 
yes, there's spatial heterogeneity there as well. Uh, for example, um, uh, a, a La Nina-like sea surface temperature anomaly in the tropical Pacific uh, really has its most reliable effect on drought in the southwest, uh, um, being Southern California, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and, um, and Mexico. And it actually tends to coincide with wetter conditions in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the summer monsoon, uh, uh, I think was referred to a minute ago, is a uh, 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 Gulf of California climate. And that, of course, is affecting Mexico the most and Arizona and New Mexico uh, quite a bit as well. But uh, California is uh, more or less immune to uh, summer monsoon. And so all of those things were taken into account in that uh, there was, there really, in our analysis, there was spatial diversity in what regions were experiencing drought when. And one important point that this brings up is that this drought event, as I showed at the beginning, has not been characterized by persistent dry conditions everywhere for the whole time. It's what we're looking at is 19 year mean across an across a very large region. We see that the moisture balance has been uh, shifted very negative over the last 19 years on average. But there have been breaks. There were there were periods of one year here and there in some areas, like even like today, the West is in drought overall, but Arizona and Southern California are quite wet right now. And um, and so that's really important that a mega drought, uh, and this is true of the mega droughts, I should say, that if we look at the mega droughts, they weren't necessarily dry across this whole region. And all of the mega droughts had individual wet years as, as well. So there is a lot of spatial diversity in, um, in these mega droughts and in the current drought and how they're affected. Got it, thanks. Um, the next question is, uh, the difference between VIC and soil bucket models for drought ranking in the historical record is very different over Arizona compared to the difference at other locations. Is there a reason for this? Oh, interesting. Um, yes, I think that the, we see the biggest difference in VIC versus bucket model soil moisture uh, uh, in the driest desert areas. Mm. where uh, um, they're actually much more similar in spring. But by summer, the VIC simulations indicate that pretty much in all arid areas, uh, sometime in June, the soil moisture hits the wilting point, meaning that, uh, that basically vegetation can't pull any more water out of the soil uh, than is there. And that means that, uh, that, means that the extra warmth um, in the last 20 years has, a, has less of an effect in desert soils than it does in our bucket model. Um, importantly, this is something that I really want to do more work on. Um, this might be specific to this particular parameterization of, of VIC that we ran. Um, I see that in our parameterization of VIC, there's really in deserts, there's no correlation between summer soil moisture and spring soil moisture, meaning that it doesn't really matter how dry or, dry or hot spring was, we're going to hit the wilting point no matter what in summertime. But when I look at the VIC runs that were done as part of, part of the National Land Data Simulation System, the NLDS version 2, I see that that's not the case, that uh, spring uh, soil moisture actually really does still affect summer soil moisture in these desert areas. And so um, which of those two uh, VIC worlds is more accurate, I don't know, but it's something that should be uh, looked into more. Great. Um, okay, this one should be a quick one. We're, we've only got five more minutes left. Um, we'll try to handle a couple more questions. This one is, are tree rings sampled through a slice or cylinder sample? Uh, the vast majority of the tree ring samples used are, that, that we have access to, or that I should say that are ever collected, are collected through cylinder samples. And what that means is that uh, tree ring scientists are generally not killing trees in order to collect data from them. We use a tool called an increment borer, which is a metal tube with a corkscrew on the end, and we simply uh, screw that tube into the tree, and it fills up with a cross section of wood out of the trunk. And we can remove that without really hurting the tree. Um, many times the pictures we see of tree ring records are not from these cylindrical samples, but instead from cross sections of trees. And those are generally taken 
when a tree is already dead. So if a tree is already dead and lying on the ground, then a tree ring scientist who has a chainsaw handy or a handsaw handy uh, might take a, uh, a slice of wood from that tree. But, but uh, in almost all cases, uh, we're not killing trees in order to collect data. Um, okay, that's good to hear. Are you able to apply this model and analysis to other regions? Would you be able to discern climate change effects in areas that are not in drought? Yes, I, I, I think that the shorter, short answer is yes. Uh, this study specifically focused on this region because it's a, it's a region that I personally love. And, um, but also this region, the Western US is a great place for methods development because uh, climate data are really good in the United States. Tree ring data are phenomenal in, uh, and tree ring data are phenomenal in the, in the West. But I think that the general approach could be applied elsewhere. And importantly, uh, the West uh, does seem to get drier in a warmer world, but the world doesn't necessarily get drier in a warmer world. Uh, there's plenty of Earth's continental surface that's expected to get wetter. And so it would be really interesting to take the same approach uh, to, study, uh, to study the wetting effect of, of global warming in some other areas. Uh, the only limitation, the biggest limitation of applying these methods to those areas is, of course, that in these in those areas, it's generally already pretty wet, and tree ring records really express drought most reliably in dry places like the uh, like the West. And so that would be uh, probably the thing that would make th applying this approach to a wet area that's getting wetter uh, the uh, most difficult. Thank you. We have a lot of other questions that unfortunately we don't have time to address right now, but um, I would ask you to talk about where your research is taking you next, Dr. Williams. Ooh, good question. Um, I am really interested in a few things. Uh, one is the tree rings give us a good sense for what the magnitude of these mega droughts uh, were during the medieval period. But trees are living organisms that are not necessarily, they shouldn't be just blindly trusted to be stationary over time. Um, what that means is that uh, over the course of a drought, uh, trees might adapt to dry conditions or during wet periods, they might adapt to wet conditions. And so their response or the way that they react from one drought to the next might not always be the same. But in this study, we're forced to treat them like they are. And so perhaps the mega droughts were all drier than, than they appear in the tree ring record, or perhaps they're all wetter than they appear in the tree ring record. I'm really interested in working with uh, scientists who use lake sediments to reconstruct drought uh, from a lake sediment perspective, which wouldn't, um, which has its own caveats, I would say, uh, but it doesn't have the caveat of being a living organism that might, that might be adapting over time. And uh, it would be really interesting to basically run a lake model using climate that we derive from our tree ring reconstructions of drought and see whether or not we get lake levels that are in line with the reconstructed lake levels that the paleo communities put together for us. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Williams, and for answering so many questions. Um, again, for attendees, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on drought.gov, and you will get a notification when it is available. And um, thank you again to everyone for joining us, and uh, stay safe and healthy, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you very much.